and in context of today's event, our uh, Resources for Peace project, a collaboration with USAID's Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation, one that is um, a, a three-year effort that we're in the middle of, and one that is designed specifically to bring together uh, lessons learned uh, and insights from both research and practice. Uh, you will see even in the kind of diversity of the speakers today working on the same project, both those worlds, uh, uh, international alert effort working with uh, faculty at the Tyndall Center um, in the UK to tackle what are really complex challenges. Um, our RFPP project looks at natural resources, climate change, and broader questions of development, specifically links to, to conflict and security. Um, so there's an awful lot under that rubric. And where we will be focusing in West Africa, of course, um, there are uh, a, a range of, of uh, challenges and opportunities in this, um, in this space. And so it's terrific for us to welcome our, our friends from International Alert um, uh, back to the center. Uh, new faces, but a common institution, a real leader um, in tackling uh, uh, the issues of natural resources, climate change, and what they mean in a conflict uh, peace building uh, context. So it's terrific to uh, continue this conversation that we've had uh, now going uh, with the Environmental Change and Security Program since 1994 when we were founded here at the Wilson Center. Uh, just a word about the center and apologies to those who've heard me uh, talk about this before. Um, but the center is actually the formal memorial to Wilson. He was our only president to have a PhD. And so Congress in 1968 saw fit to set up a living memorial where these two worlds that we have represented here today, the worlds of scholarship and research and the worlds, worlds of policy and practice, uh, could come together, uh, learn from one another, and uh, advance understanding. So we have been doing that on a nonpartisan, non-advocacy basis since 1968, and we're um, uh, led by former Congresswoman Jane Harmon, who would uh, want me, of course, to give you her very best. Um, uh, she's uh, currently on on travel. Uh, so we have um, we have titled today "Climate Change, Water, and Conflict." in the Niger River Basin. And we do that uh, and feature this international alert work in part because they have a report um, coming out on this that looks at, that combines the research and the practice lessons, and we will hear about uh, the, the results of that. Um, I think also because, frankly, in this town we don't talk enough about this part of the world. There's a lot of conversation about Africa, but, but I would say probably compared to East and Southern, we, we, hear, um, we have fewer opportunities to really delve into this region. And so while for experts working in the field, that may seem strange, but from the 30,000 foot view here in Washington, from my perspective, it's a, a, an area that doesn't receive uh, enough attention. So we're very pleased uh, to be able to have this uh, conversation. And let me introduce uh, briefly our, our speakers, both here in the room and um, uh, coming in from the UK uh, via technology that we hope will work, uh, continue throughout. Um, uh, uh, Lusaged Abid uh, Abibi is uh, 25 years of experience in international relations, peace building. He's a program was a program manager for West Africa program uh, for International Alert and senior advisor for the African Union. Um, he is uh, wears multiple hats in these discussions, but th the short version is lots of field based uh, experience. Uh, Marissa Golden, who is uh, beamed in to us, is a lecturer in climate change at the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research and the School of International Development at University of East Anglia. Thank you, Marissa. We appreciate that we can actually see you. So, Hi. so far, the technology is working. And I promise when we come time to your presentation, we'll have the camera focus on the slides here so you can make sure what you're speaking from is actually what we're seeing. <laughs> Um, and then finally, uh, Phil Vernon, who's actually going to kick off our discussion. Phil is the Director of Programs for Africa and Peacebuilding Issues at International Alert and uh, a longtime practitioner uh, in Africa and somebody who has written about it and worked in the field. And so we very much appreciate him uh, coming to join us and, and do a, a scene setter, which I think what we will now do is, is turn it over to Phil for a discussion. We'll have time for Q&A um, and uh, look forward to the conversation very much. So, Phil. Thanks, Jeff. Um, is, this, is this okay? You can hear me? Um, thanks. So yes, I think my role is uh, as, fair, as, as rapidly as I can uh, to set the scene and the framing of, of this research and this report. And um, I mean, just to say uh, thanks, Jeff, for your comments. Uh, yeah, International Alert, we're a peacebuilding organization, so our interest in climate change comes from, from that. 
And we've been thinking about, along with many others, thinking about the links between climate change and insecurity for quite some time. Um, and that's sort of the background to this. I mean, conceptually, it's kind of a no-brainer, actually, the link between climate change and insecurity. You've got vulnerable people, vulnerable households, vulnerable communities living within, to some degree, fragile systems, governance systems, environmental systems, and so on. You've got climate change, which comes into that. That produces added uncertainty, added stress. That leads to a risk of conflicts. Conflicts aren't necessarily a terrible thing, but violent conflicts are. So, uh, so there's a risk of violence resulting. It's a fairly simple causal chain that one can easily get uh, conceptually. It's sort of a bit of a no-brainer. And it's pretty clear that that's about the interaction of multiple factors, economic, environmental, political, social, uh, what have you. It sort of depends on your specialism and your particular lens, which factor you come in with. But uh, you pretty quickly see that it's, uh, it's a complex uh, interaction, as, as so many uh, social change factors are. So if the interaction of stress and vulnerability is the problem, again, it's somewhat of a, yes, I'm oversimplifying, but it's somewhat of a no-brainer that increased resilience is part of the answer, because resilience is what we have to protect ourselves against uh, stress uh, and vulnerability. And we know quite a bit about resilience. Uh, social science knows a lot about resilience. It's, it's many ways to think about resilience, but I was just thinking, you know, some of the sort of abstract nouns which we use to think about resilience are about assets, economic assets, knowledge and capabilities, both at the individual, the household, and the community and societal level people's access to support from government, from NGOs, uh, from social networks, social capital. Their relationships are critical as, as a factor in resilience. Um, freedom, people's freedom to act is a critical asset that they have or don't have uh, in varying degrees as part of resilience. And of course, that's linked to the governance frameworks within which people live and operate at the local right up to the national and international level. And so therefore institutions becomes key to thinking about resilience. Now, I'm sure you can add many other um, abstract nouns and, and ways of thinking about resilience. But the, I think the point being that thinking about resilience is not a new quest, set of questions uh, for those involved in development and, and social science. So that's all by way of saying that there's quite a lot about climate change and insecurity, which, which is quite simple to get one's head around at the conceptual and perhaps a bit at the abstract level. So far, so good. Practically, however, it's a bit harder. And one sort of gets to that point. When we published our first report on this, which was about four years ago, I remember reading a draft of it and thinking, well, OK, that's, that's easy. So what? And, and for us, it's been the search with others for the so what over the last four years. And that's where this uh, re research really fits in. There's a lot of questions which one pretty quickly which raise themselves pretty quickly when one's thinking about whether it's at the policy or the practice level, what then to do about this issue of climate change, insecurity, and the need for increased adaptability and resilience. Well, first of all, there's the massive degree of uncertainty um, about, well, in a particular place, um, what kinds of climate changes are going to happen and what kind of responses and reactions are going to take place to those. I think there's the very important thing, which is that you can take a community, if you like, but within that community, different members are going to be affected quite differently uh, by climate change. And so, therefore, they have got different degrees of resilience. And so we need an understanding of that. Um, a, a sort of an underlying question for us is that, well, if resilience is so familiar, I mean, I've been working in development and peace building for 25 years. I can't quite remember when I first learnt I learned my first framework for thinking about analyzing resilience, but it was a long, long time ago. So I can't be alone in that, and I'm not alone in that. So if we're so familiar with these concepts, how is it then that we haven't been very successful yet, if we're honest, at helping people with other forms of adaptation uh, before sort of climate change came along as, as, as the big new, big new um, concern? So there's a question about whether we really know enough about how to help people increase their resilience. And then linked to that, there's another question, which is about, well, if climate change is becoming urgent, how, is it oxymoronic to think of building resilience urgently? If resilience is about the things I mentioned, those are things you can't gift people. You can't really gift people knowledge. You can't gift people improved institutions. You can't really gift people economic assets 
uh, very easily, at least not on the scale we're talking about. So is there a risk of undermining the elements of resilience which exist already in responding too rapidly and too urgently uh, based on the anxieties we have to the problem of climate change and insecurity? A very practical question, how to target scarce resources? Yes, there may be $100 billion or more available uh, to help with adaptation, but when you spread it around, it's not that much really. So how does one target the scarce resources uh, effectively and intelligently? Is it possible to do preemptive adaptation? How does one do that? One's got to know where to focus those resources. In short, how to do adaptation is the, really the policy uh, and practical question, and that's where this research comes in. We felt that um, there's a real gap in empirical knowledge, and it's really empirical knowledge at the very local level to help understand uh, and inform policy and practice uh, <coughs> regarding adaptation, and especially with a view to thinking about um, reducing insecurity. So we got together with a bunch of partners, International Alert, with the, um, with the Tyndall Center and with the School of uh, Development Studies in East Anglia, with a, a small group in Mali called the Centre d'Appui à la Recherche et Formation, which is a small, it's a small business actually, but it works in academia in, in Mali, with the uh, Institute of Development Studies at the UCD of Ni University of Nigeria in Nsukka, and the UC University Abdou Mumoni Diofu in Niger, and of course with USAID, uh, who funded this research and have been a real partner as well in the research. It's not just a funding relationship. And um, we put together this research proposal, which you're going to hear uh, uh, more about in a minute. We chose the Sahel for a number of reasons, West Africa and the Sahel for a number of reasons, partly because we were there, but also the Sahel anyway exhibits those issues of vulnerability and uncertainty and climatic variability anyway. So we thought it's an interesting place uh, to take a look at the community level. Why the community level? Instinctively, the concept of subsidiarity seems critical when thinking about uh, supporting adaptation. Subsidiarity in the sense that decisions should be made at the lowest appropriate level. But that means decisions being made in an informed way at every level, from high policy down to household and individual decisions. And so we wanted to take a foc uh, to focus on the community level. And I suppose the two critical research questions were, um, can we see evidence of climate change increasing the risk of, of conflicts and potentially of violent, of violent conflicts? And can we find examples of resilience vis-a-vis -vis that problem? And that's really what this research is about, and I think that's my task of setting the scene, hopefully, uh, done. Terrific. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much, Phil. I think now we are uh, going online, so to speak, and going to turn the floor over to Marissa. Hello, yes, thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm Marissa Goulden. I work at the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research and the School of International Development at the University of East Anglia in the UK, and that's where I'm talking to you from now. Um, I just want to apologise that my colleagues, Roger Few from the School of International Development and Nick Brooks, who is an independent consultant, also a visiting fellow at UEA, couldn't join me. Um, but they have contributed greatly to the research effort in this project. So I'm going to start by con uh, continuing from where Phil left off and just tell you a little bit about the Niger Basin, the Niger River Basin, and why we chose the Niger Basin. You, have a, you should have a map um, that you can see, and on that is indicated the three case studies. Uh, we chose to do two case studies in Mali and one in Nigeria. And the, Ni the Niger River itself, starts in the highlands of Guinea, which is a more humid zone, and then passes through the Sahelian environment, which is much drier, in Mali, Niger, and then flows south towards into Nigeria. Um, and Nigeria is also more, uh, the southern half of Nigeria is also more humid. Um, so we've chosen these three case studies. Partly we, we we were interested in Mali, Niger, and Nigeria because they are the countries that have the largest part of the basin in them. Um, and we had to revise our plan because Niger became uh, difficult to do research in because of the security situation there, which is why we have uh, case studies in Mali. If we have a look at the next slide. 
please. So part, as Phil mentioned, part of the reason why this is a good case study, the Niger Basin, is because over the last 30, 40 years, particularly since the 1970s, there has been a trend of decreasing rainfall, uh, which you can see in the black line on the graph, and decreasing river flows in the Niger River itself, which is the gray line. Although you can see a trend with a low uh, in the 1970s, which recovers a little in the 1990s and 2000, you can see that rainfall and river flow are highly <laughs> variable. And that's an important point to make, that this is a region of high variability in climate, but with some uh, prolonged drying uh, in the few decades from the 1970s to the late 1990s. The next slide shows Sahel rainfall. Again, it's showing the same thing, really. Precipitation anomalies in the Sahel portion of the Niger Basin. You can see a distinct decline in rainfall from 1970 onwards, with a few uh, years where there was high rainfall. Um, and 2010 was one of those uh, last year. And we found out quite a lot about the impacts of that high rainfall in 2010 when we were doing our field work. Now, there's many debates in academia about the causes of this drought in the Sahel. But um, it was originally the debates focused on land degradation reinforcing a drying of the climate. But more recent research has indicated that it's unlikely to, that's unlikely to be the main cause, that actually global scale changes in circulation patterns are probably responsible for this drying trend and that these are associated with aerosols emissions in the um, northern he hemisphere countries rather than just uh, carbon dioxide emissions. But the point here is that carbon dioxide emissions growing in the future, as we know they are doing, may have a different effect on the Sahel climate than you've seen over the last 30 years. So really, this drying period is not an indication of what might happen in the future. What might happen to the future climate of the Sahel where a large portion of the Niger Basin is, uh, is highly uncertain. If we look at the next slide. So future climate change in the Niger Basin is uh, uncertain. We can tell that um, temperatures are going to increase, but um, climate models give a wide range of projections from 1.8 to 4.7 degrees. Um, change in rainfall is even more uncertain, with some climate models showing increases in the future and others showing decreases. But recent observations have shown the wetter, that wetter conditions in the central and eastern part of the Sahel, um, which um, is, coincides with a large part of the Niger Basin, and then drier in the Western Sahel, which coincides with the source regions of the Niger River in Guinea. Only some climate change models have shown um, a greening of the Sahel, so because of an intensification of the West African monsoon. So, but that's only some climate models that indicate the Sahel may green, or become greener or wetter. But what is clear is that climate variability, which is already a large factor of the climate in this region, is likely to remain very important and potentially to become more variable. And seasonal rain changes in seasonal rainfall patterns are expected. Um, and an example of this is a later start to the wet season and a shortening of the wet season. And in fact, this is consistent with some of the observations that people made to us that farmers were, were making to us when we were in the field. So the research project um, focused on three countries. Three countries. That's the next slide, please. Um, as we weren't able to go to Niger, we had a partner. Um, this slide is headed research project design. Um, we did a literature review and a desk, and desk research, and then we conducted these three case studies in the field. And we conducted around 73 interviews and some additional focus groups at national level, local government level, and in villages. 
And we tried to pay attention to gender sensitivity by making sure that we conducted separate interviews with men and women, as well as some interviews together. OK, the next slide, please. So the first case study, um, if we can have the pictures, please. Previous slide. Thank you. OK, so the first case study was in Mali at the Selenge Dam. It was constructed and completed in 1981. And this dam has had an impact both on upstream and downstream communities as well as, uh, and benefits as well as uh, some disadvantages. And one of the benefits is it created a large reservoir and a good uh, fishing resource that attracted fishers from all over the country. But uh, an incident that we focus on was in 2001 when um, a large rainfall event upstream um, was predicted, but the operators of the dam had already kept the water level in the reservoir high for a particular reason. They were expecting a large electricity demand, and this is a hydroelectric dam, uh, because of the African Cup of Nations that was being um, played, the football cup that was being played in Mali um, in a few months. So they'd kept the water level high, expecting to try and meet this high electricity demand, and then a large uh, flood was expected to come from upstream. So they had to open the gates very quickly and let out a lot of water, which caused uh, flooding damage downstream to the irrigation scheme which is just below the dam uh, where the rice farmers lost their rice crops and there was a lot of damage but also to the communities downstream of the dam along the riverbanks of which there are quite a number of communities. Uh, this was, uh, this instigated some conflict in, in that the rice farmers in, were not happy but they had the ability to take the energy company to court. And I'll, I'll say more that about that in a moment. But also in this area, we've got ongoing issues of conflict between farmers and pastoralists. And the sign that you see on the left is um, uh, a signpost to mark cattle routes. And it's a, it's a resolution mechanism that has been tried out in this area to have agreed pathways for cattle so that they um, so that farmers are prohibited from growing their crops close to or on those routes. The conflict occurs where cattle are crossing the river and crossing alongside farmers' crops, and the cattle eat the crops. The farmers then want compensation. And other issues of, that we found in this village was the impact of extreme rainfall in 2010, which caused, again, following the 2001 event, also caused houses to collapse people to lose their crops in, in, in the villages, and a lot of damage and problems for people. Next slide, please. So what we found was the communities did suffer significant losses in the flooding in 2001 and in 2010, despite having substantial coping strategies. Um, they lost crops, homes, livestock, and one man, uh, as an example, said it took his family seven years to recover from the flooding in 2001. We looked at the coping strategies and we found that men and women have different roles. Um, for example, men uh, during the flooding event are trying to help people move away from the flood water and then afterwards re with rebuilding of homes whilst women are concerned with finding shelter, cooking and caring for the sick, elderly and children. And, uh, and particularly the women talked about um, the emotional distress that they suffered. That's not to say that the men didn't also suffer that, but the women were perhaps more open to talking about it. The stake, a stakeholder committee was set up in response to the flooding of 2001, particularly because of the court case that the, ri the rice farmers brought. So uh, this stakeholder committee was set up to manage dam management dams throughout Mali to make sure that a repeat of this flooding incident, the main cause of which was the dam opening, could be avoided. And 
ca uh, the rice farmers actually received compensation from the courts for the flooding of their crops, but the downstream villages had no voice in this. They do not participate in the committee, and they received no damages or compensation. They, re they did receive a small amount of emergency aid. The other thing we looked at was the, the scheme to mark the cattle routes or cattle corridors. And actually, this uh, was a fairly unique scheme in the country, and in, we didn't find anything similar in the Niger Basin. But it seemed to have some success in that the farmers felt that there were less conflicts with pastoralists since this scheme had been instigated. And it was only about two years old when we were visiting the villages. So now I move on to the second case study in Mali, in Segu. So this case study, we had a number of different issues illustrated by these photographs. We had deforestation and erosion and, and a narrative of increasing sedimentation or siltation of the river, which had affected fish catches. However, people talked about sedimentation of the river as a problem, but research has shown that um, there's no strong evidence for this, and that actually changing amounts of water in the river might be more of a, a, a cause, um, particularly in the upper reaches of the Niger. Um, as well as problems of erosion and sedimentation, people talked about changing rainfall and flooding impacts in this area as well. And the picture on the bottom left is a house that has been partially destroyed by the heavy rainfall that they experienced in 2010. Again, it's a region where farmers and pastoralists come into conflict, and there was particularly a, lack, a, a much less tolerance in this region between the farmers and the pastoralists than we saw in the previous example. So the cattle herders, the pastoralists, take their cattle to to uh, the canals, for example, this is a canal uh, to um, water the cattle and pass through fields of farmers' crops, and often there is conflict when the, uh, the crops are eaten. The conflict isn't often violent, it's, uh, but it is conflict in terms of counts, claims of compensation which are resisted on by each side, and uh, long, uh, sometimes long disagreements about how to resolve and recompense each other, and feelings of um, uh, dissatisfaction at the outcomes when um, farmers feel that their compensation they received from the cattle herders was not sufficient, where, and cattle herders feel that they were asked to give too much. So drought has also been a region in this area. And then the, fi the final issue that we looked at was the expansion of irrigation uh, and, and the bottom right picture shows a sugarcane nursery, sugarcane plantation, which is at the moment small, but there are plans to have a sugarcane project in this region, and it's called the Markala Sugar Project, uh, which will displace a number of communities and uh, ch lead to change in land use from current uh, grazing and rainfed agriculture to uh, sugarcane plantations. If we move on to the next slide now, please. So what we found in this case study was that farmers and pastoralists both noted changes in the rainfall seasons and how this had negatively affect, affected their livelihoods. I've already mentioned the sedimentation of the river that was blamed on reduced fish catches, but very little mention of the actual impact of fishing or changing water flows in the river both because of climate variability and abstraction of water for the irrigation, um, people tended rather to talk about the sedimentation, which was interesting. There's competition for accessing, access to grazing land and water between the farmers and the pastoralists, and the, a lot of the reason of this is the expansion of the area that the farmers are cultivating. And one of the reasons the farmers are expanding the area is because of the poor reliability of the rainfall. So they're cultivating more land in a hope of getting a crop, and also because of the growing population pressure. Conflict resolution strategies, particularly between the farmers and pastoralists, there was a convention, but it's no longer working well. There was never any attempt to mark out agreed routes in this region, 
and the terms of the convention uh, are not re not fully respected by either the farmers or the pastoralists. And now the new irrig irrigated sugarcane project, which will change land use in the area, is also making conditions very uncertain and uh, causing tensions between communities and their local government representatives and communities in the state. And although people were pretty unwilling to talk about this, uh, their concerns for this project, because it's a current issue of conflict, even within villages, where it was a current issue of conflict with some people feeling uh, that there might be benefits from this project and others very concerned about it. They weren't willing to talk about researchers because, to researchers about it because it was a current issue of conflict. But it was clear that it was causing uncertainties in the region. Next slide, please. Okay, the third case study was in Nigeria, and we have some of the similar issues here in that we have, again, tensions between farmers and pastoralists over access to uh, water and grazing land, particularly on the floodplains. But we also have issues of repeated flooding. We looked at two communities who were on the banks of the river, who were affected by erosion of the river banks, and also flooding events sometimes almost annually. One community was affected by flooding annually because they were farming in the floodplain. However, some years the flooding is worse than others, so some years they get a good crop and other years they don't get any crop at all. The bank erosion, you can see the picture on the bottom left, is the village uh, where a house has recently gone over the, uh, the um, banks of the river. The erosion is rapid, it happens um, as the annual flood comes down the river. But has, uh, communities do have coping strategies in that they, move, they, they know when their house is the next one to, to be um, affected and they start building a house elsewhere on their land. But this has caused problems in that the amount of land available for farming is slowly diminishing. Um, and again, we have an interaction of these um, different types of pressures. So for example, here the farmers talked about the annual rate, the rains coming later in the year than they used to. Whereas they used to come in January or February, they're now not seeing rain until April or May. And because of that, they're planting their crops later. And that means they're not yet mature by the time the flood comes down the river. The annual flood, which is a, um, a natural process, comes down the river uh, in the high season of the river, and they lose their crops more than they would have done before when they said that they got rainfall earlier in the year. Here we also have some intervention or infrastructure development interacting with these climate and environmental related stresses. So we have the dredging of the river base, the dredging of the river which the government is keen to do to improve transportation on the river. They want to start sending barges up the river to transport goods on the river to relieve the pressure on the ne road network. For the last decades, it has not been possible to pass large uh, boats down the river. So they, it, since 2009, they've been dredging the river. And this has had some negative impacts on some communities where sand has been dumped on their farmland. But also it had an impact because the people that the uh, consulting age, the consulting company that was doing the dredging on the instructions of the government, the local uh, state government, came to explain to the communities and said that this will cause you, this dredging will be beneficial to you because it will protect you against flooding and bank erosion, which are your main problems. So communities expected some protection after the dredging. But the dredging happened in 2009, and in 2010, there was a very extreme rainfall event across the whole basin, and a large flooding event that affected these communities and other communities across the river basin. Um, so the community is not surprisingly asked, did the dredging cause, did the, dredging cause the flooding? Uh, to which uh, the response in the workshop we held was, well, no, it didn't. But what it clearly did was it failed to protect them from the flooding. And perhaps those claims should never have been made. And the problem there is the sort of misinformation or lack of communication of clear information has increased the distrust 
of the communities for the operations of the government. If you move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so the changes in the, uh, just to recap, the changes in rainfall have particularly, uh, and extreme events have had a negative impact on people's livelihoods. Again, despite coping strategies that they do have. Um, communities have conflict resolution mechanisms and they have adaptation strategies. And these are different. So different communities have different strategies. Um, and some, uh, some people within the communities are not able to uh, adapt very well because they have a lack of access to resources. An example would be those communities who are affected by the erosion of the river blanks um, but don't have anywhere else to move to and end up being displaced from their communities. And then they have concerns of loss of community cohesion and trying to integrate into other communities who don't particularly want to receive large numbers of new settlers. The poor information flow between the government and the communities limits people's responses <coughs> to stresses. So in a way, it can undermine resilience just because uh, communities are expecting one thing and they get another. They were expecting some protection from flooding. One farmer even described how he uh, expanded the area that he planted in the flood plain that year because he thought, well, flooding's not going to affect me this year because they did the dredging. Then there was an extreme event and he lost all his efforts and all his investment. And on the other hand, communities seem to have quite a high expectation that the government should be able to help them, particularly when they experience flooding impacts. They should be able to get some emergency assistance from government. And uh, the government should be able to help with the problems of bank erosion. But these expectations are not being met, and people are feeling frustrated and um, a lack of, uh, a feeling a lack of support or a la lack of concern from government towards their predicament. I think I'll just pick out uh, one or two points here. So the, the gender, there is a gender dimension to the impacts, which I've already mentioned. Um, particularly because of livelihood roles and responsibilities that, different, that differ between men and women. And a key point to make is that um, because future climate conditions are highly uncertain in, this, in, in the river basin, development projects uh, or um, initiatives, for example, water resource development, such as the expansion of irrigation, and the um, developments of dams and the dredging, uh, their impact in the future might, the way they interact with the climate might be quite uncertain because the climate is uncertain. So for example, what happens in the future to the area where people have been displaced because of the irrigation? What happens if rainfall decreases in the future and water resources in the river are not so available to, to irrigate that large area? What will happen to the land that has been cleared um, of the communities. So there are possible links to, to uh, conflict in the future. And the following slide then. <coughs> Next slide, please. So we're looking at links between climate and conflict. And we've seen that there are not straightforward links between climate and conflict. They are complex links. Uh, but there is some, some indication that climate stresses can exacerbate conflicts. But there, of course, there are many other wider factors and dynamics in society that put stress on people and their livelihoods. And the conflict we observed was largely what we'd call latent conflict or manifest conflict, latent being potential conflict or problems or differences or changes that could cause conflict, and manifest conflict in terms of conflict that has been voiced different positions or divergences of opinion, uh, complaints, whether formal and informal. But the instances of violent conflict that we uh, encountered were very rare, and they mostly occurred between farmers and pastoralists. And then often they didn't. Often conflict resolution mechanisms avoided violence and 
Um, and some kind of resolution could be uh, obtained, even if people weren't particularly happy with the solution. So climate stresses then combine with these other dynamics to um, potentially increase this latent or manifest conflict. But it, we had little evidence for how that might lead to violent conflict. And that's not to say it won't anywhere else, but in the time available and with the particular case studies we were looking at, we didn't have a lot of evidence for that. Um, but there was a lot of conflict in terms of, you could say, in, in manifest conflict in terms of, or latent conflict even, in terms of frustration and distrust of government because people's expectations of help were not being met. And definitely instances of conflict of interest between the large-scale water resource developments pursued by the state and then the impacts on those who are most vulnerable and most affected. And they were exacerbated by poor information and uh, poor processes of uh, governance, particularly participation in decision-making. So on responses, next slide, please. We did document a number of different community-based conflict resolution and coping strategies, but importantly, they differ between the different communities. So there's no one-size-fits-all uh, uh, menu of solutions. And communities themselves have their own preferences and know which solutions are most suitable for them. But they're not, uh, they're not <coughs> foolproof and not everyone in a community can access those strategies, so some are more able to than others. But some of these strategies, particularly the adaptation strategies that provide re resilience, include social networks, diversification of livelihoods, for example, different types of crops, increasing the area of crops, uh, seeking wage labor, um, and then the conflict resolution mechanisms involved, uh, for example, in one village there was a, a conflict resolution association, another village it revolved uh, around um, the chief and the deputy uh, leaders of the village, and others it involved a local government rep representative mediating between farmers and pastoralists, so different mechanisms working differently in different locations. Uh, responses had gender dimensions as well, um, for example, wage la uh, leaving the village to seek wage labour was carried out, um, appeared to be carried out more often by the men. Uh, women's associations setting up trading links and using their social networks to uh, access alternative sources of livelihood and income uh, was another example that we found. But uh, local um, government is involved in early warning and emergency response. But local government in particular is very limited, and it's limited in its funding and its ability to meet the needs or the emergency needs of people when large-scale flooding events do happen, for example. Information on developments is often incomplete, which can limit the responses that the communities can make. But we did find that the stakeholder committee set up in the Mali case, in the Selenga case, did have a role to play uh, in adaptation to potential increase in flood, flood risk in the future with climate change, because they were, it had a specific mandate to try and avoid flood damage, as well as try and meet other stakeholders' needs, such as the electricity generation and water for irrigation. And my final slide, please, on governance. So just picking out some of the government's governance dimensions of our findings, we found that the local institutions, whether they were formal or informal, uh, such as the conflict resolution associations, um, these were more trusted than the formal state institutions. The communities we looked at, they pref one of them in particular said how they much preferred to have their own association rather than go to the police, because if they went to the police to resolve a conflict with a, a pastoralist, the police ended up with the money and the community lost and the pastoralist lost and the problem, the case was remained unsolved. There was limited effectiveness of the early warning and disaster response activities at a local level, 
But partly that's because the instructions from the early warning systems, so there's, there might be an early warning that a flood event is going to happen. For example, uh, some of the villages downstream of the dam in Nigeria said that they did hear, hear of warnings that the dam was going to open from their radio, but it, there wasn't a lot they could do about it. Uh, or the, they, the, war, the flood, they waited until the flood came, basically, and, and the flood, if it came at night, then uh, there wasn't a lot they could do um, because they weren't listening to their radio. And th they could start making preparations, but often the warnings weren't soon enough or there was actually limited amount that they could do in response to those warnings. With respect to communication or engagement, communities varied in their confidence and their ability to engage with government. So some communities had a representative that they sent to local government every time they had a problem. Whereas other communities, particularly the pastoralist communities, were much less used to engaging with government and talking to them about various issues. There was much less interaction with local government. And again, to reiterate, that the poor, the, a lack of engagement or poor quality engagement in, in terms of accuracy of information or uh, misunderstandings or different perceptions can hinder the information exchange and the effectiveness of programs such as uh, disaster response and early warning programs and also the effectiveness of the solutions of the communities themselves. Okay, I'll now pass on to my colleague Lulz again. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Marissa. And uh, we will in turn... <coughs> Uh, hand it over to Luskit for some of the bottom lines from this research that Chris outlined. Well, I think after we have done this research and we have been in the field, uh, after gathering, the, we have gathered the evidence and what we have concluded is that, well, there is an extreme events, uh, extreme events, as Marisa was saying, on climate issues and uh, competition over accesses to land and water and contested water management may be exacerbated by climate change and have a potential for conflict. So this is one of our conclusion. Uh, well, we have said, well, we have found out that future climate is highly uncertain, therefore development and adaptation policies must be flexible enough to cope with extreme variability both in the weather and the drier conditions in the Niger, in the basin. Well, to avoid conflict, we have said adaptation responses must adopt fair processes and outcomes that do not disadvantage the most vulnerable member of the community or the society. Because, well, it is a multitude of people from different social political structures that are being affected by that. Well, of course, the, the other issue is the question of adaptation and peace building are linked not, not only to each other, but also fundamental issues of governance. As Marisa was saying in the, her last slide, well, there is a governance issue here that we should really look into. So it's not only uh, it's not only the adaptation and peace building are linked, but it's also the underlying factor is governance, which we really need to look at. Well, we say, well, do adaptation for the communities is not just an idol. We don't need to go with a toolkit and say that this is the adaptation package we give you. Well, that, that, that is not working and that was not what people have been expecting and that people would uh, appreciate. Well, we have to take into account existing, what exists in the communities in terms of knowledge capacities and tradition, because we cannot see adaptation in isolation of all this. As, as it was earlier said in the case studies, there are already 
adaptation mechanisms in the community which has been used and which has been there. So we have to really do take into account that all those factors. You don't go and go give them a toolkit and say that this is it. Well, of course, because of this, then there won't be one size fits all approach for adaptation. Because communities, the traditions vary from place to place. Well, of course, it's also raises the issue of governance now. There is, uh, there is inadequate national government response to climate and water issues. Well, of course, the governments have their own problems. It can be they are under-resourced or they are being trapped by perception from the past saying that, well, uh, development is a solution or construction of a dam would be a solution. But this is, so they have their own past experiences which they say that, well, this is the method and this is it, what we should do. But we are saying that, well, it's, it's not that easy. Uh, well, classic development aid has often tried to tackle the issue raised in the cases, but, well, some of this development initiatives, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the sugar cane plantation, the construction of dams, well, have been addressing some of the concerns in relation to adaptation, but, well, I think there is always, uh, it's very important that we have to really make sure that there is uh, harmony between that adaptation and also the development projects we are initiating. Uh, well, of course, we should not only target it. Well, we have to really take a holistic approach in our adaptation strategy. Uh, supporting adaptation is supporting adaptability. That is, well, again, it takes us back to the community. What is in the community? And how can we really help the community so that they would be able to adapt? rather than saying that adaptation is very critical, but how can they, adaptability is a very critical issue. Uh, well, I think, as I've said earlier on, I think adaptation strategy should not only be, it should be part of the huge, the big development package. It should not be really seen separately. Uh, and, and it should be part of the development initiative, and it should be part of it rather than taking it separately from. So our policy recommendations are, well, I think the best adaptation support practice is going to be to support adaptability in the local communities rather than well, taking a big, a bigger picture. Well, what is the what is the local communities? What are in the local communities that we really need? We have and we can we need to appreciate. Well, as as I've said earlier, or as it was said in the the research and the findings, well, there are already systems and mechanisms for adaptation in the community. So we have to really know what those mechanisms and systems are, and then we should really be able to support locally grown mechanisms rather than, as I said earlier on, bringing a toolkit and say that this is it, this is how you should do it, this is how you should go about it. But there is local, local initiative, as we have seen in the case studies, for example, in some, uh, in some communities for the flooding, uh, most of the houses that has been built along the river banks were m uh, made of uh, uh, wooden blocks, so which can really be washed out easily. Those who can afford can go into the interior and start building block buildings, which can manage, which can really w would resist the flooding. So well, there are some local initiatives that are really there, and. Or what we do as an outsiders, if we come to the community, is we should always have the do no harm principle, uh, and we should avoid anything that would weaken the what is available in 
the community. Well, we said that in order to support community, community resilience, well, it's always decision making which is very critical. And of course, again, on the governance issue. Because, well, if there is an issue that should really be made, and if a decision is going to be made, then we have to really be involved. We have to involve the communities. We have to talk to them and explain to them and listen to them before rather making a decision and say that, well, going with the package and saying that, well, this is it. So it should be a participatory decision making processes. And of course, we have to really, well, as I've said earlier on, we have to identify institutions, people, individuals who are in the community. For example, there are quite, we have elders which we have come across whenever there is a problem, whenever there is any kind of misunderstanding between the farmers and the herders, cattle herders, and when there is a dispute, there are local groups who would come together, bring the two communities together, and try to negotiate and settle. Though in some cases, what has been, uh, the outcome might not satisfy everybody, but it is an inclusive process, therefore it has helped a lot. So we have to really involve such people in our processes, including the women groups. As Marisa was saying, that the women groups have their own adaptation strategy and they really use different forms of adaptation when in times of crisis. Well, of course, the other thing is we have to understand the factors which enable and inhibit resilience. Uh, what are some of the factors? Well, we should not really say, well, this is it, but what are some of the factors? We need to identify and we need to know them rather than and what we would do would it should enable them. Uh, well, of course, as we are aware, adaptation is seen to be very urgent, but resilience is something that you cannot get it now, now, now. Well, it has to go through a process. You need to educate. Uh, well, you have to re really bring a structure on good governance. We have create, you have to, you need to create jobs. Well, we should also look into the economy of the community. So, well, adaptation is being is seen to be urgent, but I think it should be building resilience is not something that you can do it now, but it has really need to go through processes where it includes gender too. Uh, well, the issue of development and adaptation, well, we think that they are not different for us. Well, and they should not be perceived as different. Well, both of them are for change. Therefore, if we are talking, well, development is leading to change. Adaptation is also leading to change. If both are going to be a ch change agents, then we have to really synchronize them so that they would be able and they would be meaningful to the beneficiaries rather than uh, making it separate and looking at it separately. And then, of course, there is the issue of resources again. Well, development money is different than adaptation money. But I think, as I've said, if, it is going to, if both are going to be change agents and are going to help in adapting the, uh, bringing ch some sort of change for, then we have to really create a link and take a holistic approach rather than uh, looking at them separately. So these are some of the policy recommendations we came at and then, well, this is work in progress and we will get some input from you that would help us more formulate our policies, policy recommendations. Thank you. Terrific. Well, thank you, all three of you for, um, yes, indeed. for setting a context that uh, says right up front, as Phil did, that these are all complex dynamics on their own. And then if you put the, the climate change, natural resources, the development and the conflict questions all on the table, uh, you just magnify that complexity. But nevertheless, this is 
this is life, right? This is the, the, we, we live integrated lives. We have to have uh, integrated understanding of these issues and find ways as we respond to them to take account of the demands and the dictates in, in, each, of those, um, in each of those areas. And so in, in that way, it really is um, doing innovative work that uh, too often we don't get outside of those communities and talk across one, um, one another. So um, we appreciate very much this uh, introduction that uh, bases it on the scientific assessment and talking to the communities, but then also draws um, very practical uh, suggestions for the, the development community and, and responding to building resistance and, and low, uh, resilience and lowering uh, vulnerability. Why don't we throw it open for questions? I have colleagues with a microphone so that the folks online can hear it. Lauren, why don't we come down and do some of these here in the middle, and then we'll come over here on the left-hand side after that. If you could just let us know who you are and pose a question, perhaps what we'll do is we'll take a couple of them and group them, then our panelists can divide and conquer for responding. My name is Dick Ruffin. I'm with Initiatives of Change International. Um, well, that group works on building trust across different divides internationally. Um, I was thrilled with the presentation. My apologies to Mr. Vernon because I had to come in late for some reason and missed your presentation. The other two were so totally in line with the strategy that um, uh, the chairman of, of one of our initiatives is, is Mohammed Sahnoun, who was uh, Kofi Annan's close assistant on Africa for many years. And he has, for the last five years, uh, organized conferences around human security concerns and tried to emphasize the complex causes, as you have done, of any kind of insecurity and stress in a community. It's not just one thing. And uh, he has felt that the, uh, broadly speaking, the international community, nat national governments in particular, are not really uh, understanding the need to, to get hold of the connections between, say, issues of poor governance and climate and poor economy and historic distrust between tribal groups or other groups, any kind of unhealed wounds, as we saw came out in Kenya. Uh, so all these things interconnect. And it, I just want to appreciate that your whole presentation, what I heard, emphasizes that wonderfully. And I'm kind of wishing uh, to have that presentation at our next conference next summer, because we are looking at, at how do you help people working at all levels really understand the necessity to see these connections between the different causes of human insecurity. Because people work in silos, you know. And so my main comment is to really thank you. I think you've, you've done what we've been trying to lift up as, an, as a need in the world in the last several years. Um, I would ask you about um, something. I'm, if it's not related enough to what you've been doing and what you're talking about, then just cut me off. But uh, uh, Luke Nakaja, who's the executive secretary of, from Benin, executive sec secretary of the UN Convention on Anti-Desertification, um, who's very seized to this question of the loss of land. I think land the size of Switzerland is lost every year. Uh, so he had a meeting last summer in the context of our co-forum, and I'll be quick now, uh, on restoring degraded lands. And he had uh, a man named Savadago uh, Yakuba Savadogo from Burkino Faso, a peasant farmer. Um, a film that you may know of was called The Man Who Stopped the Desert. Do you know that film? Mm -hmm. It's really superb. It was shown, and this man came, a peasant, spoke no other language but local, but told of his own local strategy to uh, uh, restore land that had been lost to drought in uh, Burkino Faso. So, question. Is that strategy, uh, you know, uh, something that can be replicated more, what this gentleman did and has been done by others? Is that part of what you are trying to do? It certainly attacked governance and other issues. That's my question. Terrific. If you could pass the microphone just in front of you. Yeah, there we go. My name is Nadia Saad. I am retired from the World Bank, and I... Uh, was working on water and environment in the World Bank. Uh, 
what your presentation really emphasized all the complexities, and, but I think that what we lack today is a clear definition of what has and cannot be done except by local communities and what local communities cannot do and what should be done at the level of government and what could be done on the global level. And if we manage to have a clear definition of that, I think it will be easier to handle. We, we know a lot, we have a lot of information, but in terms of recommendation for policies, we have not yet defined clearly what is it that communities can not do that has to be done by government and what other things have to be left to the global intervention. Terrific. Do you agree with that? Okay, thank you very much, Nadia. There was one, why don't we get these in the middle and then we'll do a second round on this side. I promise we're not ignoring you on the left here. Hi, my name is Chelsea Tu. I am from the Public International Law and Policy Group. Um, fascinating talk today. I'm wondering what the next steps are for this research to change things on the ground. For example, if you plan to take this knowledge and policy recommendations to the local community or to the um, maybe even the national government um, to help them adapt to climate change and strengthen community ability to resolve potential conflicts over land and water use. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. If you just pass one more, then we'll get. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Julia with Climate Wire. Um, I guess I don't mean to be too reductive, but um, on the whole, I know we're looking at conflict, but would you say the outlook is rather positive? We've pointed out a lot of local communities having strategies already in place. Could you sort of speak to the outlook on that? Are we really looking at conflict per se, or we're we actually looking at a lot of really positive um, adaptation already? Um, if you could speak to that. Thanks. Okay, well, that gives us uh, four areas to cover. Phil, would you like to kick us off with your reflections and then maybe we can divide and conquer? Um, yes. Um, maybe I'll speak to the issue of um, the first two points, particularly the sort of the issue of um, sort of the main actors not getting the complexity of it. And then that links, I think, to the, the question about practically uh, how do we cut through this complexity. I, I think there's, um, I mean, in a way, <laughs> You know, I think we'd all share it associated with this report some disappointment in not coming up with a magic bullet. <laughs> but there isn't one, obviously. Um, and um, in a way, our hypotheses going in did get confirmed. The, yes, it's very complex. And so therefore, one's got to have institutions able to deal with complexity in order to deal with it. Now, society has some of them, but clearly not enough yet. Um, I think a couple of practical things I could say about that is I, at the risk of again sounding sort of complex, <laughs> making it complex. I think for the, for the international institutions involved, there is still a crying need for international institutions, donors, UN, NGOs like ourselves, to sort of get with this idea of dealing, of using a political economy lens to understand issues. I mean, the simple way to think about it is the silos. But it's actually, that's too simple as a way of describing the problem. If you go to the you know, not to single out anyone, but go to the USAID office or the DFID office or UN office in some of these places. How ma really, how many political economists are there? Or how many people who, who are incentivized to think about issues in a holistic way? We all have the language, but I think the institutions are not yet organizing themselves in a way which allows them to deal with issues in the way which this report says um, they need to be dealt with. And it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, but we, we've really got to get to grips with that if we're going to take seriously this problem of assisting. You see, we're still talking, I mean, as Lord Sega said, we're still talking too much about assisting people with adaptation, doing adaptation. Getting the purpose right is tremendously important. So if the purpose is helping people to increase their adaptability, it changes the way you think about it. Now, that may sound like it's too complex, to, not, not practical enough, but it is a practical thing to do, to change the way we think about the purpose of our work. I'm thinking particularly about the outsiders now, whether they're outsiders from the capital, outsiders from local government, or outsiders from international organizations in these contexts. 
So now, and I think I go back to my point earlier about subsidiarity. There's many, many examples that come out of this report and out of the presentation about how there's got to be a complementarity of approaches. That doesn't mean everyone's got to get to go and have a workshop every week. It just means that people have got to understand what is my level here. So if there are community, if there are community mechanisms which exist to help manage and resolve conflicts, are they equitable? Probably not. In fact, they're not, because communities are communities. So that's that's a level at the high, that's a higher level. That's perhaps a local government issue to be keeping an eye on whether everybody is getting what they should be getting out of these adaptation changes which are going on, and then up and up and up and. You know, if someone's thinking about building a dam, well, it's quite clear from this research that they've got to think about it in different ways than they have before. Indeed, some of the adaptation funding is probably going to be used to build dams. So we've got to be very careful about how uh, those things are, are, are planned and organised. If the government of Mali wants to increase its sugar exports, well, how's that going to... So that's a subsidiarity issue. It's a national-level industrial policy issue. How does that play out at the local level has got to be considered much better. So I think the subsidiarity thing, it, it may seem like it's a bit abstract and vague, but I think it is actually quite practical. And we've got to sort of get these things into it. We've got to use these lenses more. Okay. Um, Marissa, would you like to uh, weigh in on any of those questions? Yeah, the, thank you all for those questions. Um, the first question, um, can the approach of... Um, halting land degradation and improving uh, um, land, land use um, that the gentleman gave. Um, I think, yes, that uh, sustainable land use and restoring um, degraded land um, has to be worthwhile in the context of a variable climate. And uh, although I was uh, suggesting that the Sahel drought was more a factor of global circulation and climate change. I'm not denying that uh, local factors of land, land management are very important, for example, for ret uh, retaining the, uh, amount, the small amount of soil moisture that there might be. So, yes, I think strategies for improved natural resource use um, can be very worthwhile for adapting, particularly to drought impacts, um, uh, perhaps less so to um, flooding impacts. And the um, second point uh, about what should, so really what should be done at the level of national governments and at the global level, um, I think uh, Phil has uh, added a lot to this discussion. But in terms of conflict, coming back to conflict, I think in order to avoid conflict um, at the local level, people need to perceive that there is, there is fairness. So the, the, the perceptions of decisions and how they're made and how they affect different groups are very important for feelings of, for, for, to avoid feelings of frustration. Um, so, so I think um, national governments uh, can do a lot, and, and state government, for example, uh, local government, can do a lot to improve the way they communicate with different groups, and also to look at the impacts of their policies on different social groups, and not try, uh, and not ignore them. Um, because it's these, it's feeling that you're being ignored and that your interests aren't being met is what's causing these frustrations. And uh, one can imagine that those frustrations could in the future lead to conflict. So it's the way in which policies are implemented and discussed. Um, and a realisation or a, a taking into account that these large-scale uh, initiatives, policies, plans and developments do have different impacts on different communities and um, although it's a politicians perhaps decision to make to make those difficult decisions about where to put resources um, that uh, well communication is one to, better communication is one tool that can be used there um, and also what I noticed when talking to people responsible in government for climate change uh, programs, so there, the, the governments of Mali and 
Nigeria are starting to tackle climate change. They have climate change units there. Uh, they've created, they've done their national adaptation plans of actions. Uh, Nigeria is doing a national adaptation um, strategy and plan of action. But in some of the rhetoric that is associated <coughs> with their plans, there's a large emphasis on climate change as a source of problems. And I think sometimes there's an overemphasis on global climate change as a source of problems. When actually, there are, as we know, there are multiple stresses that people are coping with. And that perhaps there is a danger that if we emphasize uh, climate change as being responsible for things, or actually climate change isn't the only stress that's responsible for a number of um, problems. So I think that's another example where there is a need to recognize complexity. Uh, but it's a tension. It's a tension between getting a simple message across to people about climate change and then recognizing the complexity when actually trying to uh, help build resilience to climate change. Uh, as for next steps on the ground, well, we've already held three public workshops, um, two in Nigeria and one in Mali, where we brought together stakeholders and presented our preliminary findings. And they were very interesting workshops um, and we got people to identify um, sources of resilience or factors that might lead to, might reduce the risk of climate stresses causing conflict. And then factors that might, uh, conversely, might increase the risk of conflict. And we, we started a dialogue there with those stakeholders. And in particular, one of the workshops in Nigeria, where we actually brought some community members uh, representatives of their communities face to face with those in state government who were responsible for some of the things that were affecting their lives. So we had community members asking the people from the dredging company, did the dredging cause the flooding? So that's opening channels of communication. Uh, and so that was, um, appeared to be very worthwhile. And, and we will have, uh, I think Laws of Good will be able to tell you a little bit more about future events that are planned. So I'll pass on to him. Well, I think uh, one, of the, one of the results which we feel that has really, of this research is it has started, it has created a platform for debate and discussion at various levels. Well, if we start at the community level, we, we, had, we met with a group of community leaders, members of the community. Now they have started thinking, what is climate change? Well, it is abstract for some of us and for most of them, but at least they have started debating, they have started discussing about it, which is a very positive move. And as Marisa was saying, well, in the three countries, the two countries we visited, the governments have national action, they have national plans. But, well, as I said earlier on, well, they have, the, the issue of capacity is there, resource is there, and if you see this, it's also from the international level. Well, development resources, development resource, adaptation resources for that. So well, that silo has also cascaded down to the community level. So the complexity is there too. So these are some of the challenges we have, but well, we had a very interesting discussion in uh, Abuja, when we brought civil society groups together to discuss the, our findings and to, uh, to get their views. And they said that, well, it's a very, good, a very good start. So, well, we have such an event now here in DC. We are going to have a similar event in Niger, Niamey, uh, early December, where we are planning to bring civil society groups from the sub-region and also government officials and the ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, who has, a, uh, who has already developed a plan on climate change. And there is also a water resource management unit of ECOWAS, and also the Niger Basin Authority. So we are actually opening it up for discussion and debate, so that people would be able to see beyond that stereotype saying that, well, climate is. Climate is the only factor, but we are saying that it is not. There are quite a number of other factors that has contributed to what is going on globally. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think it follows in many ways from what you've said. It's a, the mixed story. But Julia's question about the lessons, if we're to draw it from, you know, in her, her case, from the perspective of a journalist who's looking at issues in climate and, and conflict, is this a, are there elements of the good news story? Or, I mean, obviously it's the mix, but how, how, how do you write that story in terms of what, from what you've seen in, in the work here? Uh, yeah, I, th I think um, I, I would say the model we used, the research used for thinking about conflict was this sort of model of um, latent, manifest, violent. And I think, as Marissa said, there was the clear evidence of sort of the latent to manifest um, situations occurring at the very local level, uh, and bearing in mind the limitations of, a, of, of, the, of the research. Um, no evidence was found of the sort of the next level of es step of escalation from uh, manifest to violent or, you know, or, or large scale. Um, I think the perception is that that could still happen, but we, we certainly saw no evidence of that, and I think that's part of the story. It's part of the results of this research. Um, and I think, I think what that speaks to is the fact that um, there's, a, there's a version of the climate change and insecurity story, which is the sort of Cecil B. DeMille version, if you like, which is sort of big picture, massive refugee hordes crossing borders and so on, international conflict over rivers and all, and all that sort of stuff those could, those things could happen um, but I think it, it's a, in general it's much more of a it's not really a step change at the moment it's an incremental change it's the the frog in the water you know the story of the frog in the water and the water is being boiled and and so I think I think I think policymakers have got I've got to be thinking about well where might this lead but at the moment in terms of this research there was no evidence that, that uh, there's a massive risk of, of violence uh, happening anytime very soon. Okay. Thank you very much, Phil. We had some questions over on this side. Well, we got a bunch of them. You can just hand it over. Teresa, ladies first. There you go. Paul Aletto from the World Bank, Africa's Sustainable Development Department. Um, I had a, a micro-level question about your focus groups. Um, in terms of how easy and how much were the representation of pastoralists in my own work and trying to sometimes reach pastoralists, it's much easier to overrepresent the sedentary people than it is pastoralists when you're doing focus groups. Um, which would le also lead me into a question about, and again, Phil, I apologize, I also missed the beginning of your presentation, so I wouldn't, I, you may have covered it there, is about AQIM. Um, because it does seem to me that the pastoralists are uh, supporting AQIM, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, which has kidnapped uh, French nationals um, and has also uh, killed two French nationals in Niamey, um, mainly operating out of Mali. Um, and then the second thing I was, you, you mentioned at the end, the Niger Basin Authority, I was interested in your thoughts on the work that the Niger Basin Authority has been doing in bringing together people from the various communities in terms of study tours, not for uh, government representatives, but actually for people who are in dam areas. For example, taking people from Tilabari to Segui um, and so on, and what you all thought of whether this is along the lines of what you're talking about, because you hear you have a transnational body trying to do some of the work of helping facilitate the process of learning between communities. So three questions in one. Thank you very much. Bob Reynolds from the Atlantic Council. Uh, certainly a lot of food for thought this morning, and uh, just based on your last question, uh, another thing that's not my actual questions, but we had a program recently at the council with representatives from uh, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, and uh, Algeria, and talking about the, the problem of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb as well as Boko El Haram. Uh, and one possible evidence of uh, violent conflict that you don't see might be people leaving the land to go to join some of those groups. That's um, just a suggestion. But my actual questions are on something totally different, <laughs> which is uh, directed mostly to Marisa and Lusiged. Um You mentioned the 
somewhat water intensive agriculture of rice farming and in particular sugarcane farming. So in relation to that, did anybody look at the appropriateness of these agricultural choices uh, in a region that, as you mentioned, is prone to high variability in rainfall and river flows? Uh, are these foreign assistant assistance funded projects in whole or in part and if so uh, uh, has anybody talked with the assistance agencies about the appropriateness of these agricultural choices and third are these intended for export these crops that would be grown with the additional water through irrigation etc Hi, uh, Paul Bagower from Calvert Investments. Um, I wonder briefly if you could share any observations you had uh, about the capacity and willingness of the companies that are engaged in some of the development projects that you mentioned in engaging in this uh, adaptation uh, discussion and also in recognizing the role of local communities in uh, development decision making. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think that I think we had yeah at least three of you right there. Okay, great. Alan Shapiro from Booz Allen Hamilton. One simple question, in the course of this study, what aspects, particularly in Nigeria, uh, causal factors for climate change did the members find related to oil and gas? Hi, uh, I'm Jerome Hansen from Management Systems International. Um, and my question is on early warning systems. And just to uh, get your thoughts on um, experience you had on early warning systems, either formal or informal, that may have been a part of the kind of positive mitigation response mechanisms you saw at the local level. And as a follow-on to that, if you think there is more potential for those either, again, informal or more formalized to help in this kind of uh, subsidiarity uh, connection, if you will, um, especially I'm thinking more on the transparent side of early warning, like kind of on an Ushahidi model or something like that. I mean, I know there's an echo warn system, but that's really closed loop. And um, even though it does look at human security issues, um, thinking that maybe that type of system may be more transparent and kind of help create the macro to micro kind of transparency and connection. Okay, well that's a bunch of them, uh, a bunch more. Phil, would you like to kick us off again? I w um, yeah, Jerome should declare an interest because he's the next colleague of ours. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I'll just on that one, I'd say yes, 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 personally, but the people who are on the ground might have um, more to add, especially on the issue of transparent alternative approaches to early warning. I mean, early warning is a funny thing because if you think about governance, if you think about what is the fundamental role of governance, it's really early warning. I mean, if, governance is, if governance is about politics and if politics is about managing differences and if the problems of differences are about differences getting out of control, then early warning is at the heart of good governance. So, 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 so I'd say yes, but I mean, but one does have to take specific things seriously and if there's a risk of of this escalation from latent to manifest to, um, to, to violent, and that's not related to environmental stress. I think that's something that I personally think is very, very important. And I think the closed loop model is fine as far as it goes, but the thing about early warning is the more people who are involved, the more your information you're likely to get, and the better analysis and interpretation of it you're likely to get. Uh, on the Al Qaeda, uh, I think it's fair to say it was outside the scope of this research. Um, but conceptually, yes, the idea that disaffected families, youth, whatever, might find themselves moving towards those sort of, uh, embracing those sort of um, revolutionary movements. Um, yes, that's obviously a phenomenon which exists, and that's one of the ways that Boko Haram is being understood, or poorly understood, I think, but that's one of the sort of the ways it, it's, it's thought about. I would take issue with the statement um, to Paula that um, you said, I think, pastoralists are supporting um, Al-Qaeda. Pastoralists is a, is a very large group of... Okay. More yeah. If you look at the, the, the Torex who are, yeah. you know, in connection with the Qaeda and the Maghreb, I mean, there's... Absolutely. You know, Torex have been very co closely connected with AQIM. And, and that's absolutely... And, that, and that's linked to sort of bigger political issues to do with the 1994, I think, peace settlement in Mali, for example, uh, and whether that's being 
whether that peace settlement was sustainable, in my view it wasn't, uh, and that's one of the problems there, but it certainly was outside the scope of this study. But I think definitely as a phenomenon, if people's, if young men in particular's livelihoods or their perception of their family's interests seem to be being even more marginalised, then that's where those sort of people can get their recruits from. Okay, Marissa, do you want to jump into the fray? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, there's a bit of a delay. I can see, um, I can see myself um, a few, uh, probably about 10 seconds ago on the screen <laughs> you're watching. So I am paying attention. <laughs> um, okay, so the pastoralists, again, we did specifically try and speak to um, pastoralist groups because we realised that we can't just l listen to the... Um, the, the, the farmers' side of the story when they're talking about the conflicts between them. And that just, uh, we did speak to um, two pastoralist groups by specifically go and, going and seeking them out um, and making contact and found them actually uh, very welcoming. In fact, whereas the farming communities that went, we went to had somewhat some signs of fatigue, some of them. Oh, researchers, oh, we've talked to people before, nothing ever changes. Um, the pastoralists, the two pastoralist communities, were not at all like that. In fact, one of them, they said, oh, we've never had anyone come visit us at all. <laughs> um, and were very keen to tell us uh, their experiences. Um, but this wasn't a, a quantitative survey, so we didn't um, try and get sort of representative sample of these different groups. It was based on qualitative interviews, trying to speak to people with di from different perspectives. Um, so that's so we did succeed to some extent. Also, um, when we were talking to people in local government, um, we got um, an interesting side of the story from former pastoralists or people who were who are ethnically the same group as pastoralists, but were now. Uh, government bureaucrats who um, often talked about the need for modernization of pastoralism. So quite a different view from them, um, but also uh, talking about some of the um, uh, complaints of uh, pastoralist groups. Um, okay, so if I move on now to um, the question about um, the water intensity of rice and sugarcane crops. Uh, yeah, we did question this. In fact, we spoke to the people um, who are responsible for expanding the irrigation and asked about the, uh, are there any limits to uh, water resources? And um, the view was that, no, we're not limited by water, we're limited by money. Uh, we we would like to in, in, expand irrigation, but the limiting factor is the money for the investment, not the water. So I think there probably is a need for some uh, scientific study of um, water for irrigation in the region. I'm sure the organization responsible for expanding irrigation have done this, but they weren't necessarily going to share it. Um, so I would be very interested to see some research on the on the uh, water aspects of expanding um, rice and sugarcane production, because there seemed to be a bit of a conflict, really, uh, um, ambiguity there. Because on the one hand, they were talking about needing to reduce rice production, encourage vegetable growing, reduce uh, water-intensive crops and try and incentivize farmers to reduce their use of water. And on the other hand, they were just uh, starting a large-scale ir sugarcane irrigation scheme. So it seems somewhat um, of an ambiguous approach to um, water management. Um, but we don't have full information on that. And. As for whether the crops are intended for export or for home consumption, again, uh, I think probably both uh, export, foreign export earnings would be uh, very important for Mali, for example. But also there is a large 
sugar com consumption within the country. And some of that sugar cane may be used for ethanol, uh, well, as a byproduct of the processing. So both I, I expect is the answer, but I'm not an expert on that uh, topic. Um, the oil and question about Nigeria and climate change related to oil and gas. Actually, um, it was a topic that came up quite a lot when we were talking to government representatives, particularly at the national level uh, and other stakeholders at the national level. So Nigeria is making efforts to reduce emissions from its oil and gas industry. And there are programs to um, reduce gas flaring, for example. And uh, a recognition at national level that this is relevant for the impacts of climate change. Whereas in comparison at a more local government level, very few people talked about uh, fossil fuels or oil and gas as contributors to climate change. At a local government level, the narrative was mainly about deforestation. And people were talking about the need to reduce deforestation and protect the forest. So I found that very interesting, actually, that at a local government level, the narrative was predominantly on deforestation, which you could say was a, a sort of an older uh, narrative linked to the degra environmental degradation narrative, whereas at national government, people were talking, were starting to talk about oil and gas. Um, early warning systems. Um, there are some positive examples that we came across. So, for example, in Mali, the agrometeorology department are, um, have a wide network of farmers who take measurements of rainfall and feed these back to the agrometeorology department via, via uh, various networks. And they monitor um, soil moisture and um, crop responses in attempt to produce um, forecasts. So that they produce foreca weather forecasts, which they disseminate, and they also gather agrometeorological information from farmers um, to, um, uh, to use for interventions. And one of those interventions that they've been trying out in Mali recently is rain seeding, which is quite interesting. So they have been actually intervening and trying to produce rain using um, uh, flights, uh, rain seeding flights, which is supported by NCAR in the United States, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's supported technically by them, but it's something the Malian government are paying for, and they've been doing for a few years now, and they believe with positive results. And actually, I had a question from one of the participants in the workshop we held in Lokoja, who said, uh, can you tell us, can people create rain? Because we have people coming to the villagers who say that uh, they can create rain. Is this true? Can people create rain? And part of my response was, well, actually, on, on the scale of the whole planet, people are affecting the climate. Uh, and I explained the climate change and the greenhouse effect. On the scale of the country, well, in Mali, they are trying to create rain by using airplanes. Uh, but from my perspective, one person in your village, I would say, probably can't. I would say they can't uh, affect the rainfall. But that's from my perspective. So it's an in it was an interesting question from the participant there. OK, I think. Um, Well, we can, I think we, I've answered all the Sure, terrific. There, yeah. Okay, would you like to? Just also pick up some of the questions that have not been answered. When it comes to the role of the Niger Basin Authority, well, the, the Niger Basin Authority is an intergovernmental body who is negotiating development projects on behalf of the state. Therefore, do they go to the community? Well, I'm not quite sure, but they are there, and they are supposed to really do that. And we talk to them uh, about their role and uh, well, they say that well, mostly they are negotiating very high level development projects like dams. For example, now there is a big dam going on in, uh, in Mali, which has been there for age. Well, they have, been yeah. they have been negotiating between the Niger and Niger Mali governments because of the 
amount of re water that might really reduce because of the dam. So, well, they are they are government agencies, but I really doubt whether they are really being very active to be involved with the communities. But they have offices or uh, in the Niger Basin uh, countries, and their headquarters is in uh, Niamey, and that was one of the reasons we, we wanted to have the the sub-regional meeting in Niamey so that they would be able to engage on the discussion. Well, uh, well, you see, this research, the expectation people have about from the outcome of this research is so huge, but I think, well, our original idea was actually to really give evidence to some of the issues related to climate that climate change triggers conflict rather than addressing the Al-Qaeda, the natural gases and things like that. However, Al-Qaeda has been a contributing factor because we could not do our field research in Niger mm -hmm. yeah. because we were restricted not to travel to Niger. And we could not do it in the northern part of uh, Mali where we were really keen to do uh, in Mopti because we were not allowed to go further north. So, well, that has been a contributing factor negatively in gathering some of the evidence to our research. Uh, when it comes to Nigeria, to oil and gas-related things, well, as Marisa said, that this, that issue has come up uh, in a couple of uh, events, in a couple of discussions we had with people. But when we, when we see the dredging, from the government perspective, which has not shared with the community, was to reduce the, amount, the number of cars on the roads. By that, well, they had two objectives. One, they were planning to reduce the number of fatalities. Two, well, of course, the emission of gas from the trucks. But that has not been communicated. But I think this is, well, a very, well, weak connection, but that is, how the government has really done something related to that. Uh, well, the Mali, the water intensive uh, uh, development projects, well, I think uh, there has been some concerns from the farmers saying that, well, we are competing for resources. Well, if the big sugar cane plantations are going to take all the water for their irrigation, well, our our subsistence farm is going to be affected. Well, you can see those, but it's not that big yet. So these are some of the things that that's all that should refer. Okay, terrific. Well, um, we've, we've, we're nearly to the, the end, end of the hour. I, I think it is, um, uh, I'm, I'm looking to see if there are any final quick ones, but uh, yes, why don't we take the one more over here, if we have a microphone and then, um, We'll have a chance for you to come up and, and uh, continue the conversation informally. But ma'am, you. Very quick question. Um, and thank you very much for great presentations. My name is Swathi Varival. I'm from the Army Corps of Engineers Research Division. Um, and my question was that, um, and I really echoed your points um, on more climate sensitive development. But the problem I'm having in my research is the time scales for funding don't often match. And development projects are usually funded for one to five years. Um, and obviously climate change impacts happen at longer time scales. So I was just wondering in your research if you had encountered any sort of um, how you negotiated that, um, that sort of conflict of time scales. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Phil, you want to handle that one yeah. given your I, earlier I, comments? I think it's, um, maybe it goes back to the earlier question from uh, the World Bank, um, that it's actually, ha it, framing it right I think is critically important. So climate sensitive development is a bit, Mm. <laughs> but I think, you know, this question about external agencies supporting sugar plantations and so on, what should they be thinking about? You know, we have gender sensitivity, we have environmental sensitivity, we have conflict sensitivity. I think there's something like adaptability sensitivity. So of getting away from climate sensitivity, I mean, that's got to be out there. But in terms of what we're talking about, people's ability to adapt equitably and successfully and peacefully, then if someone's, whether it's a company, it's an individual investor, it's a government, it's an outside agency, is thinking about you know, what are the, what's the due diligence that we should be doing in terms of thinking about the impacts of this investment or this project 
I think we need to add one to that long list of things that's there. And it's a kind of, it's an intuitive one, apart from anything else, which is what would the impact be of this project, investment, business opportunity, etc., be on the adaptability uh, of this society, let's put it that way, you know, within this society, the different people, segmentations of peoples and communities within this society. Tremendously important to think that through as part of the project. You know, from a political perspective, I think maybe those who are advocating for that, perhaps this idea of Al-Qaeda, you know, those, you know, we could perhaps scare some people into taking it seriously, <laughs> actually. You know, if, if you think that actually, you know, it's a bit like the sort of the, um, the link between security and HIV under the Clinton administration, that was very clever. To, to motivate people to invest in, anti, in HIV by, by saying it was a security issue. So I mean, maybe there's some tactics there one can think about. But I think fundamentally, yes, climate sensitive um, policies are very important. But a simpler way to think about that is, is what I'm thinking of doing going to have an impact, positive or negative, on the adaptation potential and capacity of the people affected, yes or no? And then where the no's are, because there's going to be some, what's the mitigation that needs to be done? Perfect. Well, um, very well timed in terms of our, our, our timing for our session, Phil, and um, and uh, thank you all for some excellent and challenging questions, ones that uh, clearly indicate great interest in the work that you all have done and interest in the acting on that work and, and, and continuing it. So uh, we thank you very much, um, folks here in the room and Marissa uh, uh, there in the UK um, for sharing this with us. Uh, we certainly look forward to how folks like uh, USAID's Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation that's in part supporting this research uh, takes it and works with it. And I think that's in, in many ways the work of all of us to, to help uh, these important outside actors uh, play uh, constructive roles. And then, as you said, importantly, taking the results of this research and engaging in dialogue with local communities and local governments um, so that we can uh, have that uh, full engagement throughout the, the process to both improve the analysis and increase the prospects for uh, some of this uh, broader uh, version of uh, adaptive capacity that, that Phil is enunciating. So please join me in, in thanking our panelists for a very rich discussion. Thank you very much, Marissa. <laughs>